Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Matt Schumar. I uh, work in the School of Environment and Natural Resources at Ohio State University, where I coordinate the Ohio Bird Conservation Initiative. And this is a consortium or a collaboration of partners throughout the state of Ohio and regionally. So we work with everyone um, like the Fish and Wildlife that Laura is representing, um, as well as US Fish and Wildlife Service, um, NGOs like the Nature Conservancy and Audubon, and universities and museums and institutions throughout that region to advance bird conservation. So a lot of my work is uh, coordination of partners and, and working for long-term conservation planning. And I get to work with great folks like Laura Kearns, who's with me today, and I'll let her introduce herself. Yeah, hi. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Okay, good, good. Yeah, we had a little bit of a, uh, having a kerfuffle with our state computers this morning. So I'm on my personal laptop. Um, so hopefully things work okay. But um, yes, I'm Laura Kearns. Uh, I'm a wildlife biologist with the Division of Wildlife. And I work out of the Olentangy Research Station. And I primarily help to coordinate uh, monitoring and research for a lot of our uh, state threatened and endangered species, as well as more charismatic species like the bald eagle and the uh, peregrine falcon. Um, but I've done a lot of work with forest songbirds um, throughout my career and um, am happy to talk more about some of those forest migrants this morning. Great. Um, all right, so I'll go ahead and get started to keep us on track here. Um, it's unfortunate that we can't all get together to uh, share an birding experience, but I imagine that a lot of folks are home right now and getting an opportunity to maybe spend a little bit extra time in their own yard, their own local patch. And you're probably noticing the spring phenology uh, more closely this year. Uh, I know I have. I've been able to walk my neighborhood sometimes multiple times a day. Um, and it's been a real treat to see what's leafing out and what birds are arriving. So to get us started today, I wanted to talk a little bit about the timing of migration, when birds are showing up. Um, and Laura's gonna follow up with some more details on a few of those species that you'll get to see either right now or in the very near future. So we're just entering the peak of songbird migration. So. Uh, for me personally, it's a really exciting time because I get to see a lot of these boreal breeding birds that are just passing through for, for very brief times, like the, the Nashville warbler shown here uh, on the title screen. So um, let's start with life cycle of birds. Um, it, you know, I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar. We have often thought of birds as our birds and they're here during the summertime and they maybe leave um, during uh, the winter time to head south and, and spend those months at, in warmer climes in Central and South America. But the life cycle of birds is, is really complex and we're learning more and more um, as ecologists what, what birds do throughout the course of a given year and, and the needs that they have. So the example I have shown here is a viri, um, and this is a rare breeder in Ohio. Most of the individual breeders turn up into or head to Canada um, but they're just showing up now in fact I think it was yesterday we had our first viris show up um, in the Columbus area so I'm really excited about these um, and migrate uh, to take advantage of abundant resources throughout different times of the year so if you think about you know your own yards your backyards and the trees and your lawn um, we really only have that bright green um, available resources from about May um, into maybe August. And this is when the birds are here trying to take advantage of those resources. Not only the fruit and vegetation, but all of the insects um, that are associated with those. And then during the winter time when those just become limited or completely absent, Birds concentrate into locations in the tropics in Central and South America. Um, and they're generally in really dense um, congregations in some of these uh, habitats um, in Northern South America. So they do this to maximize reproductive success. Um, 
you know, migration is a daunting uh, experience, but um, there's, there's a lot of advantage to coming north um, to these lush boreal resources. So migration for birds, really we start to think about it in mid-February. Um, for a lot of folks, some of the earliest signs are red-winged blackbirds. And this photo is a great um, illustration of that. <laughs> We've got this red-winged blackbird who's already, um, he, he's prepared for the breeding season and already on territory. And you can see that it's still kind of winter behind him. So in mid-February, we also start to get the earliest American woodcock. Um, many of those are probably on nests already um, in Ohio. We may even have some, some young beginning to emerge. And that's about when waterfowl migration um, starts as well. So it's this, this period in mid-February that uh, birders really start to get excited. Um, they can sort of shake off the, the winter doldrums and get out there and start looking at some exciting migrants. In March, that's when waterfowl migration peaks. Um, there are a few festivals throughout Ohio that you maybe have heard of. Uh, the Shreve Migration Sensation is one of those. So if you go to the Shreve area um, in sort of the northeastern part of the state, that's a great place to see a lot of uh, migrating waterfowl, um, cranes, and, and other birds as well. Raptor migration is beginning around this time, and American woodcock have settled into their territories. In mid-March, we also get our earliest passerines, those songbirds. So tree swallows and eastern phoebes um, show up by mid-March. I have an eastern phoebe nest at my house, and they're already um, young in the nest, and um, I'm sure they're, they're uh, going to be fledging in the next few days. So for these songbirds, you know, they're, they're well into the breeding season already, um, and this is um, really a sign that, uh, a lot of excitement is about to come. So in early April, this is when things really start to kick up and get exciting. Waterfowl migration is still strong during this period. So in early April, you can still get out to your local lakes and reservoirs and see a lot of uh, migrant ducks. Um, raptors are, be are peaking um, and starting to slow. So you know, in April, we get big movements in the early part of the month, but by the end of the month, um, they, they've really sort of uh, slowed down. Shorebirds are beginning to migrate as well in early April. Um, this is a group of birds that I think miss a lot of people. They're not really tuned into. If you're in the southeastern part of the state, um, and typically if you'd be coming to Vinton Furnace, um, you know, this, this might be a little bit more difficult because there aren't as many larger fields um, in this part of the state. But if you're thinking about central and even western Ohio, um, this is really a great opportunity to start getting good looks at shorebirds. Here in the Columbus area and some of the farm fields, we get really big movements of American golden plover um, shown here in the photograph. So this is a boreal breeding uh, shorebird uh, that passes through during April. And shorebird migration is really long. Um, it starts in early May, in early April, but goes through at least a month or, or a month and a half. Um, so you have a lot of opportunity to see those. So if you are in an area that has some agricultural fields, um, start checking those out in late March and early April. And if they're holding any water, they're muddy, um, these can actually be really fantastic places to see uh, large flocks of migrant shorebirds. Yellow-bellied sapsuckers are moving through as well, and we're starting to get more and more uh, of those little uh, colorful and vibrant songbirds. So kinglets uh, come through, golden crown kinglets are the first, and ruby crown kinglets are right behind those. So these are tiny little birds. They're not much larger than a hummingbird, um, smaller than warblers, um, and we, we're still getting big movements of ruby crown kinglets right now. Winter wren are moving through, and then our first signs of warblers um, are starting to show up. So in early April, Louisiana water thrush and yellow-throated warblers are coming through. Um, and this is, I think for a lot of folks, uh, the sign of what really they get excited or they think about with migration. So we're just entering um, some of the peak movements of warblers right now, and Laura's gonna talk about some of those uh, species in more detail. Um, something you can get out right now and have really great opportunities to see um, in a few minutes. So by mid-April, um, waders are, are starting. Um, 
And I, I saw a lot of messages on some of the listservs and even the Athens area about folks seeing great egrets and wondering if they're nesting in the area. Um, unlikely that they are nesting. This is the, the, the exact time when a lot of birds are moving from southeastern United States around the coast um, to breeding areas in, in the Great Lakes um, and farther north. So we get pretty big movements of great egrets. You probably see some of those in your local rivers um, and some small lakes as well. Um, shorebirds are continuing and those warblers are starting to arrive in larger numbers. Um, black and white warbler, palm warbler, and Nashville warbler are uh, the next birds in line, some of the earliest. Um, at this time, we also see blue gray gnat catchers. They're these tiny little sprites um, that just make this really soft, kind of twee uh, sound. They're really abundant, but because they're so small and because they don't have loud, vibrant songs, they often get overlooked. Um, but when they show up in mid-April, they start nesting right away. So there are blue-gray gnat catchers probably in your, in your local wood lot right now, um, either building nests or on nests. And at this time, we get big movements of sparrows as well. Um, you probably have heard uh, white-throated sparrows uh, in your neighborhood. They're still moving through. That's that classic old Sam Peabody Peabody song, or Oh Sweet Canada Canada, um, if you're uh, from northern latitudes. So late April through the first week of May, that that kind of brings us almost up to date. Um, so we're getting big movements of vireos. Um, I've heard all the vireos uh, come through now. Philadelphia vireo is the only one that I haven't heard, but that's more of a rare transient migrant. Um, we get big movements of red-eyed vireo, warbling vireo, and blue-headed vireo. Um, and all of those species nest in Ohio. Some of you may have seen Hummingbirds already. I know I have ruby-throated hummingbirds at my feeder. I'm really excited about um, those returning. Um, and house wrens, thrushes, and warblers. Um, basically, at this time of year, um, where we are right now, uh, the, the, the bulk of songbirds are, are moving through the state. By mid-May, so within the next week or so, um, shorebirds are still really great. So um, be on the lookout for those local farm fields that may be wet. We've been getting a lot of rain here in the last few days. So some of those fields might be really great opportunities to get good looks at shorebirds. Um, flycatchers, Swainson's thrush, uh, black pole warbler, rose-breasted grosbeak. I know talking to Dave yesterday, he said he had several rose-breasted grosbeaks at his, in his backyard at his feeders. And I've heard reports from a lot of folks as well. Um, so keep an eye out for those gross bees. The time we get to the end of this month, migration is really going to be winding down and a lot of the birds are going to be moving into their breeding territories. Cuckoos are some of the um, longest um, sort of dwindlers. We get them sort of stragglers um, into June. Um, gray cheek thrush is a boreal breeding bird. Um, they're one of the last ones to come through. Um, and we do get large movements of scarlet tanager, Lincoln sparrow, and indigo bunting, um, like the bird shown here. I've had scarlet tanager and indigo bunting um, already um, within the past week or so, and some large movements of indigo bunting. Um, but we're going to get some really large movements of them um, throughout the remainder of this month. So. Those are really great birds that you can see in your backyard. Um, they're forest and edge specialists. So scarlet tanager and indigo bunting are both birds that you can get really great looks at. And so if you're interested in, in understanding more about the phenology of your local area, you can do this through eBird by clicking on the explore tab. Um, and that will bring you up to um, this page that you see here on the left and you can type in specific regions and, and zoom in and look at the bar charts to show when people are coming. So I'm not going to spend any more time on this right now and I'm, I'm going to switch it over to Laura um, and then at the end of this presentation we're going to spend a little bit more time talking about eBird uh, and learning how you can understand more about the birds in your area and also contribute observations uh, to science and to understanding that that local phenology. 
So with that, I am going to stop sharing here and uh, let Laura take over. Okay, thanks, Matt. Uh, let me get my screen shared here. <coughs> While we're doing that, if folks have questions, there's a Q&A section at the bottom. Type those in, and I'll keep an eye on those. And at the end, we'll try to make sure Laura, if we have time, we'll have Laura and Matt uh, answer those. OK. All right, well, I'll go ahead and get started. Can everybody see my screen OK? Yep. OK, good. great. Fantastic. OK, so yeah, I'm going to talk in a little more detail about some of the um, some of the birds that Matt just talked about, a little bit more about their life history. Um, first of all, um, uh, a lot of these birds that are coming through right now, they're called neotropical migrants. And a neotropical migrant is a bird that breeds in North America. So that's Canada or the US and winters in Mexico, the Caribbean or Central and South America. Uh, and so technically that is a bird species in which a majority of the individuals breed north of the Tropic of Cancer, which is 23 degrees north of the equator. Uh, it comes through a little bit south of Florida in the Caribbean. And then those birds winter south of that latitude. And a lot of times when we say neotropical migrants, we're kind of talking more about songbirds, uh, passerines, but this also includes shorebirds, raptors, and some waterfowl. Yes, even some of our raptor species go down to the tropics in the winter, like osprey, um, broad-winged hawks, uh, some of the sipiters. So, um, so yeah, they, they migrate too, some pretty far distances. And then um, the migration distances by these species can vary quite a bit. Um, you have your more of your short distance neotropical migrants to your long distance. So for example, um, up in the right hand corner there, I have a picture of a Northern Perula and they're documented to migrate as, as few as 300 miles. Whereas something like the red knot can migrate up to 10,000 miles. So they're, they're literally going from one end of the globe to the other. So it's pretty, shorebird migration is, is really just a phenomena that's amazing. Um, but I'm gonna focus today on what we see in Ohio's woods, since this is a day in the woods uh, presentation during migration. Um, and, and this is both spring and fall, but, but focusing more on the spring birds today, but wood warblers are some of the more exciting species that we see come through this time of year. And um, this time of year, the, the male birds are in their brilliant breeding plumages. So they're really beautiful to see. Um, they stand out a little bit more than they normally would. They're also singing. So they're easier to detect if you hear them singing then you can hunt them down and, and get a good look at them. Um, so I'm gonna spend most of my time on those today, but um, another group I'm gonna talk about are the thrushes. Uh, <clears throat> and then there's other groups that Matt talked about a little bit too, like the tanagers, the scarlet tanagers. Um, there's also summer tanagers, uh, vireos, uh, Matt, Matt mentioned those. And then there's other groups like orioles and flycatchers and stuff like that. But like I said, I'm gonna just talk about a few of the wood warblers and uh, a thrush. Um, so these wood warblers, there's actually 38 species that breed in Eastern North America. There's more out West. Um, <clears throat> 24 of those actually breed in Ohio. Um, some of them are kind of unusual breeders they're not super abundant, but we have some others like the yellow-throated warbler that you see here that do breed here in the state of Ohio. And then we have 14 that are just basically migrating through. So the only time of year that you will see them is when, um, is, is right now. Um, <clears throat> and these, like I said, are more of your long distance migrants. They're coming from uh, Central America, South America, the Caribbean. Um, <clears throat> and part of the reason we don't see these birds until now is that they're primarily insectivores. And um, we, you know, the temperatures just aren't warm enough to provide the food that they need to fuel their migration or to fuel their breeding. So that's why we don't see them until about this time of year. And, um, and they're called the wood warblers because most of them are um, somehow dependent on forests 
for breeding. Um, they rely on forests during migration as well. So it goes back to our, you know, all of our day in the woods principles about the importance of healthy, healthy forests. Uh, most of these wood warblers are sexually dimorphic. Um, so that, <clears throat> that means that the males and females look different. And for the most part, this time of year in their spring plumages, the males tend to have more colorful plumages. Um, <clears throat> so an example here is a photo of a hooded warbler. This is a male, um, very aptly named. He has his black hood and yellow over his body, but um, very attractive looking. Um, these wood warblers tend to be small, which is one reason they can be a challenge to see. Um, so length, typical lengths between four and a half to seven and a half inches. So, um, you know, basically smaller than the size of a typical hand. Um, and they're very light as well. Seven to 25 grams, that's the weight of several pennies. So they don't weigh much at all. But they're also known for having these really diverse vocalizations. That's why they're called warblers. Um, and lots of, uh, lots of different um, patterns that they exhibit, and I'll talk a little bit more about those with some of our species today. And then I want to talk about the thrush group as well. Um, there are just eight species common to Eastern North America, and the most common one that you're really familiar with is the adult American robin. They're not a neotropical migrant, um, but they, they do some short distance migrations. Um, the, the robins that you see in the winter are probably different from the robins that you have breeding in your yard or your, your backwoods, um, <clears throat> but that's the most common thrush. Uh, they're also insectivores, but they do eat things like worms. You know, you see them foraging in your lawn and eating worms. Um, they'll eat land snails, they'll eat fruit, especially in the fall, and they become an important seed disperser because of that. And thrushes are typically a forested species. Another really common thrush species is the eastern bluebird and those are the, those are dependent, they're cavity nesters, so they're dependent on trees to nest in, but they also like more open areas where they can forage, but they need that that forest component as well in their landscape. Um, so the thrushes, most of them are um, sexually monomorphic, so the males and females look really similar. There may be slight differences, like in robins, there's usually a slight uh, difference in the, the uh, reddish color. Um, they're larger in size than the wood warblers. They're um, seven to ten inches long, so you know about twice the size of some of these warblers and 50 to 80 grams, so a lot heavier. Um, but they also, like the warblers, have some really diverse and distinctive vocalizations that um, I think they're one of the easier groups to learn their songs uh, because of that. And then over here on the right, this is a picture of the adult wood thrush, which is a really common forest breeder um, here in Ohio. Um, but it's a species that we're concerned about. Um, so real quick, before I get into specifics, just I'm gonna do some quick uh, refresh of just some things to be thinking about when you're birding. Um, <clears throat> so just some bird identification tips are, you know, first of all, yeah, visual cues, looking at the birds. One uh, or two characteristics, just kind of knowing what to expect for shape and size of a species can help you narrow down what it is you're seeing. So just for example, the, in the top middle there, ducks. Ducks have a very characteristic look. So you can tell a duck apart from like a heron. So um, a heron is a long-legged waiter. They have long legs. Um, so very easy way to tell them apart. Um, <clears throat> Uh, woodpeckers, for example, they are a tree clinging bird. So down in the bottom left hand corner of the screen there, you can see the silhouette there, tree clinging, um, have a characteristic posture. Um, compare that with something like your swallows over here on the right hand side, which are aerial insectivores are always, usually when you see them, they're flying around in the air. So you definitely know if you see something flying around in the air like that, that that's not a woodpecker, but it's a swallow or some kind of aerial insectivore most likely. So anyway, keeping in, keeping in mind shape and size. Uh, <clears throat> another thing, plumage. Yeah, plumage is really key, um, especially for a lot of these wood warblers. They have some really distinctive patterns and colors. The blue jay is one of our uh, more distinctive um, 
<clears throat> blue birds here in the state of Ohio, not too many blue birds, um, but they have pretty distinctive uh, wing and tail patterns and a crest on their head. <clears throat> and so speaking of crests, um, so other details, there's um, oftentimes you want to look at maybe not just the overall plumage of the bird, but look uh, more closely at details around the head and face. Um, so for example, with the tufted titmouse, they're one of the few species that has this crest. Um, and uh, so that's a, a good cue to look for with a bird like the tufted titmouse. Wings can be very important, looking at different patterns and colors on the wings. So for example, you see a red bird in the forest. Most of us normally think, oh, we see a red bird, it's a cardinal. But this time of year, another red bird that you could see is the scarlet tanager. And so <clears throat> what's very distinctive between the scarlet tanager and the cardinal is the scarlet tanager has these black wings and uh, cardinals don't have those. So that's uh, a helpful way to distinguish the two. Along with looking at the head, like I just said, cardinals have crests, scarlet tanagers don't. Um, and then finally, um, looking at details uh, with the, the rump and the tail. So this, for example, is a northern flicker. Um, it's a, one of the woodpecker species, but one very easy characteristic to look for with this is the white rump. It's very distinctive, especially when the birds are in flight. Um, so that's an, a kind of easy way to say, oh, that must be a northern flicker. Even if it's flying away from you, you can tell, hey, that's a white rump, that's a flicker. So, and, and finally, I'm gonna talk just briefly here about vocalizations. Um, I'm not gonna go through, whoops, all of those, um, but just know that there's, each species has different vocalizations. There's these mnemonics that sometimes are helpful to help remember um, some of these different um, songs. So like the American Robin goes cheery up, cheerio, cheery up, cheerio. Um, and, and so on, and I'll talk a little bit about those as I'm talking about the different species. And then, yeah, I wanted to talk just briefly about behaviors. Um, <clears throat> so the bird on the left, Matt mentioned earlier, the Eastern Phoebe, and uh, they're not a terribly, I mean, you look at it here on the left side of the screen, it's not a terribly um, colorful bird, but it is distinctive, you know, it has distinctive head plumage, posture. But one thing that really gives it away is that it likes to flick its tail. And unfortunately, I don't have video in here to show that, but you'll see this bobbing on the Eastern Phoebes that's incredibly characteristic and is really helpful for identifying that species, especially with it looking kind of drab like that. And then over on the right-hand side, the white-breasted nuthatch. This is one of the few species, so like the woodpeckers, they, you know, kind of go up and down trees, but the white-breasted nuthatch likes to turn around and go down the tree. Um, so it's a little bit different, uh, has a, a really unique movement pattern on the, the tree bark um, compared to, to woodpecker species and such, along with distinctive plumage. But the behavior, oftentimes I'll see that nuthatch movement out of the corner of my eye before I see the plumage and that helps me identify it. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about uh, these four wood warblers and this one thrush. And I, and I specifically point out these because these are exclusively migrants here in the state of Ohio. They are just, well, for the most part, I think we have a few magnolias breeding here in the state, right, Matt? Um, and some, you know, unusual places, but for the most part, they are just coming through during migration. And the numbers are also really much higher during migration. And um, you're likely to see them almost anywhere. I live here in the city of Columbus. Um, and they get, uh, I have Nashville's in my backyard. <laughs> it's really amazing that this neotropical migrant has chosen to hang out in the city for a few days during its migration. Um, so, so anyway, these are just some really uh, typical um, and relatively easy to distinguish uh, migrants that, that we wanted to point out to you today. Okay, so I'll start here with the Nashville warbler, and um, these are coming through in big numbers right now. I've been hearing them around my neighborhood on a daily basis, um, and they're and the males are relatively. And I'm going to focus more on male plumage, um, just because those are the easier ones to pick up, and because the males are singing, you're more often going to hear them, and then you can can find them. Um, so I'm going to focus on those. Um, but the males have a gray head and a white eye ring and a yellow belly. And then 
as you can see, the wings are kind of more of an olive green color. Um, and then the song is really, I think, one of those useful songs to learn um, right now. It's like a two part song and it kind of does a seesaw and then a trill. And I'm going to play that for you. I'm going to um, link to the Audubon or the, uh, sorry, the Cornell website. And um, hopefully I can get this to work. So, okay, remember two part pattern, several two note phrases followed by a trill. And playing now. Did you hear that two part phrases and then a trill? No, you didn't hear that, Matt? No. No, I wouldn't hmm. hear the sound. Um, let me hear your, your let me adjust audio. my volume. Hold on. Let me try that again. Is that better? A I little bit? It. It's a little quiet, but I can hear it. OK. All right. OK. Well, hopefully, that gives you a sense. Um, and let me go back to the PowerPoint. OK, <clears throat> so um, just I want to show you the map real quick of the Nashville Warbler. So just to give you a sense of where they're coming from and going to. So they've been wintering down in Mexico and Central America. And they're migrating throughout the whole US this time of year. And they're headed up north. Um, they will uh, breed in areas like Northern Michigan and Northern Wisconsin and Northern Minnesota and then New England, but a lot of them are headed up to Canada. Um, so long distance travelers. And then just another shot of the Nashville. This is a female or an immature uh, Nashville warbler. Um, sometimes it's hard to tell the males and immatures apart, but just to give you a little sense of how different the males and females can look. Okay, so um, next I'm going to talk about a bird called the Tennessee Warbler. Um, and this also has a gray head like the Nashville, but the eye, the characteristics around the eyes are different. It has a pale eyebrow, so that is distinctive. Um, it doesn't have the yellow as much as the Nashville does. It's more um, kind of pale, more yellowish green on the top, pale underneath. And the, there's no wing bars on the wings. But again, like the Nashville, you're probably going to hear this before you see it. And it has a three-parted song. So <clears throat> let me give that a try. Can you hear that, Matt? Yes, but it's very quiet. Not as loud as the practice run yesterday. <laughs> it's too bad. I think it's the computer, and I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think it's the links. Links are in the PowerPoint, so you can go back later and listen to it. <laughs> um, OK, let's go back. We we will make that PowerPoint available later. It's going to be recorded and we'll do a posting. So you'll have all those hot links. Great. Thanks, Dave. Okay. Um, so the Tennessee is actually coming a little bit further than the Nashville. And so oftentimes we'll, because of that, we'll see the Nashville's earlier in migration than the Tennessee's after because the Tennessee's are coming a lot further. So the Tennessee's are coming more from, um, Central America, less so Mexico, down all the way as far as Panama and into no from Northern South America. Um, they're also headed up to the far North. Again, not too many of those breeding in the US, more, more of them or most of them are headed to Canada. Why they got the name Tennessee Warbler, it's a long story. Uh, a lot of birds are not named <laughs> well. Um, and then I did, I did pull a couple photos of um, a female Tennessee warbler. She has, it's hard to see here, but she has a little bit more yellow on the throat than what you would see in the male. And then in the fall, 
they become completely different looking. Um, they're more of, uh, have got a yellow color overall. Like I actually think they're prettier in the fall than in the, the spring myself, but that's just me. Um, but anyway, just, just again, pointing out some of those differences um, between males and females and immatures and spring and fall. Okay, so the uh, next bird is the magnolia warbler and probably of um, these species we're working with today, this is probably my favorite in terms of how uh, the plumage is. It's very, very bright, bright yellow, bright blacks with some bright whites thrown in there. Um, so it has a black mask. You can see the black necklace on the, the throat there and then these black streaks coming down from it on the yellow throat and belly. And then the <clears throat> upper parts, the wings and the top of the head are gray and black. And the song is basically weeda, weeda, weeda. And it gets, it's really quick and it gets, starts soft and gets loud. So let's give that a try. Okay, here we go. Weeda, weeda, weeda. See if it does it one more time. So I'd say one of the faster songs of some of the warblers that are coming through right now. And these guys are also coming from, um, you know, pretty, uh, pretty far south, not as quite as far as the Tennessees. They're more in Central America and the Caribbean, but um, headed up north, we get them breeding again, northern Michigan, northern Wisconsin, um, also in the Appalachians, um, uh, in the mountains. And uh, again, another picture of the breeding male on the left, and then the female on the right, just to give you an idea of that, that contrast between the two. But the the white wing bars are, are a helpful cue on the species. Okay, my next here is the black pole warbler. And um, I think this is probably my favorite song <laughs> of the ones that we're gonna talk about. Um, so it's pretty distinctive in that it's a, it's, the male is a black and white bird. And um, we also have the black and white warblers that Matt talked about, but the difference with um, the black pole warblers is that you see that white cheek. That's a really distinctive characteristic to look for um, with these. And they're also behaviorally a little bit different from the black and white warblers. Black and white warblers, oftentimes you'll see them going up and down the sides of the trees, whereas these just stay perched up, usually pretty high in the tree. Um, so anyway, they're black and white with black cap, the white cheek, they have a black mustachial stripe, doesn't, can't see it super well in this photo. Um, and the wings also, they're a little bit longer than most of the other warblers. And part of that is because they, um, they do this phenomenal um, migration across the Atlantic Ocean in the fall, um, which is, uh, is part of the reason they need these longer wings to be able to do a long distance flight like that. And then, um, the thing I like about them is I really like their song. It is, to me, I always felt that it's, it sounded sort of sinister. And um, other people have uh, said it's like a helicopter-like song, like it's a, a helicopter um, coming by and then leaving. So it's got a, um, a really distinctive sound. So hold on here, hopefully. This is a little more of a high-pitched sound. So. We'll see if Matt can hear this one or not. There we go. Matt can sort of hear it. <laughs> to, to be fair, that's sometimes what it sounds like in the field. Yeah, it's true. Very yeah. quiet. Mm -hmm. But I'll also, yeah, like all of these birds, I'll get this in my neighborhood. I, a couple years ago, I had one just like in a tree down the street. I'm not sure if I've ever ha actually had one in my yard, but um, but yeah, they are um, show up in amazing places this time of year. Um, okay, 
again, these are a pretty long distance migrant um, coming all the way from South America in this case. So they're one of the, the later uh, birds to migrate through. I haven't, haven't seen any or heard any black poles yet. Um, and just to point out on this map, this map is just showing the green is showing the spring migration. So like I said, like this is the best time of year that to see them here in Ohio, they're coming through, but they're, they don't fall, show up on the fall migration, the yellow, because again, they're taking this phenomenal leap across the Atlantic Ocean back to South America um, because of wind patterns and things like that. That's a more efficient way for them to get home. So pretty interesting species. Um, and again, uh, you see another photo of the male on the left. I think that mustachial stripe shows up a little bit better in this photograph here. Um, and then for contrast, there's the female. Um, she looks really different. <laughs> and um, our final species I'm going to talk about is the Swainson's thrush. Um, so this is, again, a thrush species. And it's uh, a migrant coming through. And I think one of the best characteristics to look for on this one, um, it's kind of, you know, this brown bird with some speckling on it, not, not terribly exciting. But what's really distinctive, if you look closely at the face, is it has a buffy eye ring, and then it looks like it has a stripe leading to the beak that's kind of tan. And they call those the spectacles of the Swainson's thrush. So, that is a really great cue to look for. If you can get a good look at the face, that can be a diagnostic characteristic that you're looking at a, a Swainson's thrush. And a lot of times we'll see these, um, they will forage on the ground. So you see them on the ground. And I would say more often than not, um, yeah, that you'll see them in the woods, but, um, but yeah, they will be foraging on the ground in the woods. Um, so yeah, not terribly interesting tan back, white belly. Um, they're about the same size as a robin, maybe slightly smaller. And um, they have they have a song that I think I think a lot of the thrush songs kind of sound kind of haunting and ethereal. Um, <clears throat> and this one, I I always learned it as I am not a hermit thrush, which is another kind of thrush. I am not a veery either, which is another <laughs> another thrush. Um, uh, but I will say that the particular example of song I have doesn't follow that very well. So, um, but, but the thing that I want to point out is that they also have a call that they give off that kind of sounds like a spring peeper. So if you know your frog sounds, and I'll, I'll play both of these here in a minute, um, that can also be very distinctive and something that they, during migration, that they'll say that or call more often than sing. Um, so let's see what we can do here with the sound. Okay, so, so I think the song playing here, that is the I am not a hermit thrush part. It doesn't do the whole song here. So this is the I am not a veer either. Yeah, one thing that helps me with to distinguish this from other thrushes is that the song is ascending rather than mm -hmm. descending. So mm -hmm. wood thrush and hermit thrush, um, their songs descend in pitch and speed. And this one kind of speeds up and gets a little higher pitched. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. so yeah, maybe maybe a future day in the woods, we, we should do a thrush focus. Um, they're, they're fun birds. And then um, I'm gonna play the calls. So again, this one, it sort of sounds like a spring peeper, but it's just one call or one, one at a time. I don't think that was the one I wanted. There we go. Just a single peep. Peep. So I would say, you know, if all of these birds that I just introduced to you, if you can just remember that peep noise, I think you'd be doing great and you would help you cue into some Swainson's thrushes this, this time around. So, um, all right. And again, these are super long distance migrants. They're, you know, potentially coming from as far as Peru, the Andes. Um, so headed up north into the boreal forest to breed. Um, 
I had these in the Adirondacks. You can see the Adirondacks on that map um, many years ago when I was doing work there in the summer. And um, again, like uh, these can be tough if you don't have good light to be able to identify them for sure. So the, the picture on the left, you can see, eh, I don't know, if I saw that, I might have a hard time giving that a call unless I knew it was in the right habitat. But the, the picture down on the, the right hand corner, you can see again that buffy spectacle around the eye that, that helps you cue in to what it is. So well, with that, um, yeah, uh, we can, um, I'm open to questions again, if Matt, uh, he's gonna take away and um, talk a little bit more about using eBird. Um, but yeah, can answer more questions here in a moment. Okay, can you see this, Laura? I can, yes. Okay, great. So um, I wanna just close this out here and talk about a really fantastic resource that's free to everyone and um, it helps contribute to science and our understanding of birds and that's called eBird. So we don't have a whole lot of time to get into the nuts and bolts of eBird. So I, what I'm gonna talk about today to finish us off is mostly a conceptual discussion of eBird um, and hopefully that um, encourages you or, or is of interest that you'll explore it some more. And I'll be sure to share some links to resources and tutorials with Dave so that he can post those on the Day in the Woods website with all of the rest of the materials from today. There's some really great tutorials and short courses you can take if you wanna learn more about how to use eBird, how to set up an account. Um, so just here in the last few minutes, I wanna um, talk about what eBird is and why it's such a fantastic resource. So stepping back, you know, a lot of what we know about birds um, is from long-term monitoring programs. And a lot of that is from citizen science. The one that we cite a lot as biologists is the breeding bird survey. And this is a volunteer abundance, a point count that's been done since the mid 1960s. And this is really important because it's helped us track populations of birds that we might not otherwise have been able to do. So one example I like to show a lot is that of red winged blackbird. I'm sure everybody in this session today has seen or heard red winged blackbird sometime in their life, if not today, <laughs> and um, as you woke up. This is one of the most common and abundant and widespread birds throughout North America. Um, so if we didn't have any monitoring programs, we would expect that you know, all is well in, in red winged blackbird life. But looking at the trend of count data for Ohio, we see this long-term consistent trend since the 1960s. So although the species is still really abundant, um, if you look at that abundance index, it's still in the hundreds compared to some of the warblers or, or rare sparrows, which is you know, uh, only in single digits. However, if this trend is to continue, red winged blackbird may not be so common and widespread in future years. Um, so these citizen science programs are, are really important. Um, and they've helped us track populations over time. Um, trend on the left is for ruby-throated hummingbird. Um, they've done quite well in Ohio and throughout North America. Um, we've had a lot of expansion of mature forest, um, and this is a forest breeding bird, um, but also the availability of hummingbird feeders um, has really helped this species as well. The trend on the right is for grasshopper sparrow, and this is very representative of a lot of the grassland birds that we have in the state um, and throughout eastern North America. Grassland habitat is becoming less common and rare in some instances, and as a result, a lot of those grassland birds are doing poorly. And so citizen science data, so data that's just contributed by volunteer bird watchers is really important and it's used a lot by scientists. Um, there have been thousands of publications in recent years using data from bird watchers. So you as a birder can really contribute to science and conservation planning. So eBird is this portal where birders can submit their observations. Every time you go out, um, you can 
keep a list of the birds that you're seeing and then enter them through the eBird website. Um, at a base level, eBird is useful for creating these distribution maps. This is similar to a distribution map that you might see in any of your field guides. And this one in particular is for wood thrush. Um, but what's great is that with eBird data accumulated over time, we can actually get a lot more information like abundance and, and density. And so using eBird data, we can see that wood thrush is, is most common throughout southeastern Ohio, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and New York, that central portion of the Appalachians. Um, so this is a much richer picture than we get from just a distribution map. And all of this is coming from eBird data. We can also see where they're most abundant throughout any time of the year. Um, and this is coming directly from the eBird website. Um, if you click on the science tab, they've done this for a few hundred species now. They have enough data. Um, if you're like me, you can spend hours of your day looking at these maps. <laughs> um, I find them really fascinating. You know, they're interesting not only from a birder's perspective to see when and where you can find this, but uh, as a conservation biologist, these are really important as well. We can understand where birds are throughout the given time of the year for conserving and preserving different habitats. So wood thrush, although it's a primarily a central uh, northern Appalachian breeder, um, they migrate throughout all of eastern North America and they overwinter primarily in the Yucatan Peninsula uh, in Mexico and parts of Central America. And so it's important that we actually focus on those areas as well for conservation. And again, all of this is coming from uh, observations submitted by bird watchers. Um, so really great opportunity to contribute to science and conservation. Um, here's another animated image that I could spend hours <laughs> just staring at and obsessing over the details. So what you're looking at here is the centroid, so the center of the population for 118 different bird species throughout the course of the entire year. And so you can see where those populations are moving over time. And this gives us an idea about where some of the most important areas are um, in the Americas for habitat conservation. You can see that, you know, from Mexico through Central America and down through the Andes of South America are really important for overwintering species. And that birds are really dispersing throughout the Appalachians and the Great Lakes area and Boreal Canada for nesting. Um, this again is on the science tab, uh, which Julie posted in, in the chat box. And I'll, I'll be sure to share a lot of these, the links to these resources with Dave so you can post them on the website. And then you, just like me, can spend hours of your quarantine day looking at these uh, <laughs> images as they scroll by. So in addition to just um, entertaining you for, for hours with animated images, uh, eBird data and, is really important for conservation and it's played out in some really fantastic projects. So a few years ago, eBird partnered with the Nature Conservancy to set up this conservation program in California. So this is an area of the country that is really important for migrating shorebirds. Um, there's a lot of agriculture in this area, rice and other grains, and these fields get flooded at different times of the year. Um, and they found from eBird data that, that this area is highly important, globally important for migrant shorebirds. So they set up this reverse auction system. Um, if you've ever seen the, the movie Moneyball, it's kind of that same concept, but instead of baseball, we're talking about uh, conservation biology here. And the Nature Conservancy was paying farmers to conserve their agricultural fields, manage the water levels, for shore, shorebirds at different times of the year. And that was coming from real-time bird observations submitted by bird watchers in the California area. So a really great example of how everyday uh, citizens uh, can contribute to science and conservation um, just by bird watching and sharing those observations. And so if you are a teacher um, and if you have children right now, uh, you are by default a teacher because I know a lot of you are helping your, your students at home. 
So there are a lot of resources uh, for you to use eBird um, in the classroom or for your kids as well. So by clicking on the science tab that, that Julie shared in the chat and we'll share later, there are loads of resources in here for you to learn about birds, learn about the science behind what we're doing with those observations. And you can even download some of the data and, and play with it yourself if you're interested in, in the math behind it as well. And these can be really great uh, project examples for uh, teens or, or folks who, who might want to play with, with real world uh, data sets. And so I'll encourage you all to contribute today. Um, there will be links uh, available later for how you can sign up for eBird, how you can learn about it. Um, and I'm just going to go through a few slides here to um, help you maximize your, your contributions. Um, so there's another example of a, a seventh grade class that where all the students set up eBird accounts and had uh, competitions with each other to see who could submit the most observations. So maximizing your contributions, um, you know, and I encourage you just as, as those paying attention to the natural world to, to do more than just check that species off the list. Um, really watch it and pay attention to what it's doing. Um, and now is, is really a better time than ever to, to do that and spend extra time outside. So there's a lot of information that you can add to your eBird observations, including multimedia. So you can add photos, videos, and audio recordings to your checklists, as well as detailed notes and breeding codes. And here's an example of a checklist that I submitted. Um, and this is from the OSU airport here in Columbus um, of a brown thrasher that was carrying nesting material. Um, and so from this observation, I know that brown thrashers were nesting at this site. And so if any researcher in the future is trying to you know, research this species or this group of birds, um, we now have confirmed breeding evidence uh, for this species because of this checklist. Um, it's also fun for me to go back in time and see when I maybe had different species building nests at different times of the year. Um, so it was um, really helpful to do that. So there are lots of breeding evidence codes within eBird that you can explore and add those. And um, what's great about this is it forces me to really pay extra attention to the birds out in the field. Um, and so I'll, I'll share a link with uh, explanations for all of these. And, and by adding these to your observations, you really enhance the power of, of that contribution. So uh, I'm gonna go through some examples here really quickly. Um, if you know what these are, you can enter them into the Zoom webinar chat panel um, and just announce these. So anybody, hopefully everybody knows what this species is. Um, somebody type it for me in the chat box there. It's just going to get harder from here, folks. So <laughs> not your opportunity to look like a star. <laughs> All right, we've got a few robin ants. Yes, very, very great. Um, anybody know anything else about what's going on in this photograph of a robin? Any information from this photo that is uh, telling you something about what this bird may or may not be doing? All right, Curtis got it. So this is an American robin, and we can use the CN, the carrying nesting material. Um, code. And this confirms nesting for the species. And so um, it's really helpful information. You know, American robin is one that we maybe don't necessarily need to toil over whether or not it's nesting in the area. Um, but we can get some really great phenology data from this um, in the future. How about this one? Hopefully a lot of folks have seen this species. Anybody know what it is? Give me another second. All right, Tom got it. Great job. This is a killdeer. Um, and what we see here um, is a bird faking injury or feigning in in injury. Um, and they do this to lead predators away from the nest site. So this is called a distraction display. Um, a lot of birds actually do this, but it is 
most pronounced and easily observed in killdeer. Um, so if you've ever walked um, down a gravel driveway or along the side of a road and you've seen a, a killdeer stumbling around, um, there's probably a nest nearby. Um, the nest can be difficult to find. They're very cryptic. Um, it's based to scratch on the ground and they lay their eggs directly in the gravel. Um, but this bird, this adult bird, is trying to lure any potential predators away from the nest site. Here's a species that I, I know a lot of people really love. So hopefully somebody um, in uh, the panel there uh, can get this one correct. Great, Emily got it. This is an Eastern bluebird. Um, the, uh, the behavior in this photo is maybe a little bit more cryptic. Um, maybe some folks don't know, but does anybody know what's going on in this photograph? What that, what's that white mass in the bird's mouth? This is a little tougher. So this is, a, this is actually a fecal sac. Um, and so the baby birds actually poop out uh, uh, little, little packets uh, of poop that the, the adults carry away in their mouths away from the nest site. So they do this for a couple reasons. One is to keep the nest clean um, so that they're not encouraging any parasites or insects um, in the nest, um, but also to detract predators from finding a nest as well. So they're, they're really great homemakers um, and they, they carry the poop from the young away from the nest. So the last uh, couple here, I'm just gonna go through quickly. They're a little bit more challenging. Um, and so here we have a baby bird. And baby birds can be difficult to identify in, in the field. So I encourage you to sit quietly and watch because you'll probably see the adults come in. This one for me was uh, not too difficult to uh, identify because of the, the feathers here. So, Right on that little nub of a tail, we see some, some cinnamon or orange colored feathers. Um, and that's what we see in an adult gray catbird. So we can use the recently fledged young code for, for this individual. The last one here is probably the most challenging. Um, hopefully folks maybe know what kind of bird this is. This is a marsh wren. Um, and we use a different nest building code for, for wrens and woodpeckers because they can actually build multiple nests. Um, we call them dummy nests sometimes. A male will set up multiple nests to attract the female and they'll eventually settle into one of those. So we use a slightly different code for marsh wrens. So these are just a few examples of a lot of the different codes in there. Um, and I'm gonna share a lot of resources on eBird with Dave and he can post those on the Day in the Woods website. So hopefully some of you are interested and will explore this because it's a really great resource uh, for conservationists and for biologists as we analyze those data.